lot about Jewish languages and especially about Jewish Neo-Aramaic. And you're gonna learn a lot more in this session today. And let me start by sharing some slides with you. The Jewish Language Project promotes research on awareness about and engagement surrounding the many languages spoken and written by Jews throughout history and around the world. And the most urgent task in this work is to document endangered languages. And we work with our partner organizations, including Wikitongues and Living Tongues Institute for Endangered Languages and Lashon or Mother Tongue in Israel and the Endangered Language Alliance in New York, all of which are recording speakers of endangered Jewish languages. And also with the Northeastern Neo-Aramaic database that Professor Jeffrey Kahn is gonna tell you about that is recording Jewish Neo-Aramaic in particular. And we have raised um, some money for this important documentation work. And we urge you, we'll give you the link at the end of this uh, session. We urge you to contribute to this, this urgent work. Another important component of this work is to raise awareness about Jewish languages. And the Jewish Language Project does this in a number of ways. We have a website, jewishlanguages.org, where there is lots of information about many Jewish languages. And we post on social media, on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, including fun facts, which you just saw at the beginning of this show. And we have videos on YouTube, including many of endangered Jewish languages. And we have events on Jewish English, Ladino, Bukharian, Judeo-Arabic, Sephardic Jewish, Papiamentu, and more. And this event series that you're currently attending is spotlighting Iran. And the first event in our session was a historical and linguistic overview of Jewish languages in Iran. And the last event focused on median languages like Judeo Hamadani, Judeo Isfahani, Judeo Yazdi, and others. And today we'll be focusing on the Kurdish region, on the Jewish Neo Aramaic spoken by Kurdish Jews. And then our final event in the series will be in March, and that will focus on Judeo-Persian in the 20th century and focusing on the shift from languages that had long been spoken to more standardized Persian and to the more Jewish versions of Persian. So how do the Jewish Neo-Aramaic dialects of various towns compare to each other? And how do the dialects of Jews and Christians compare? What work is currently being done to record Jewish Neo-Aramaic and share it with the public? And why is this work so important? Today, you'll be getting answers to those questions. This is the order of events for today. First, I'm gonna show a short film by Alan Niku. And then um, Professor Jeffrey Kahn is going to give a historical and linguistic overview. And then Shahnaz Youssef Najadian is going to share information about the dictionary she has been working on. And then Ariel Nosrat is going to talk about the organization that he runs in Israel called the Lishana Institute. Alan Niku, a heritage learner of Jewish Neo-Aramaic, will talk about why he decided to learn this language and and what he thinks is the future of it. And then musicians Adi Kadusi and Alon Azizi will explain why they have been recording music in their ancestral language of Jewish Neo-Aramaic, and then will be honored to share the world premiere of two songs from their upcoming album. And then we'll have discussion and Q&A. And at any time during today's session, you can write your questions using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And all of the event today will be recorded except for the music part and will be posted on our website tomorrow, jewishlanguages.org on the events page. Here we go. So first, let me share the video 
of um, that Alan Niku created. It's a short film about the um, uh, about Jewish Neo Aramaic. Throughout history, Jews have been a part of and a part from the surrounding society. This is reflected in their languages from Judeo-Italian to Judeo-Arabic, similar to the surrounding language but with distinctive Jewish features. We see these trends in the Kurdish region where Jewish Neo-Aramaic was spoken. After the Jews were taken into the Babylonian captivity, many of the new writings were in Aramaic instead of Hebrew. This includes much of the books of Daniel and Ezra, along with famous prayers such as the Gadish, which were included in the prayer liturgy. The Assyrian alphabet, which we now know as the Hebrew alphabet, was also adopted at this time. Hundreds of years after the destruction of the temple, Jews continued speaking and writing in Aramaic, leading to the Talmud in Babylonia, Persia, the Zohar in Spain, and even songs like Chad Gadia in Germany. But Aramaic wasn't just a written language. From Zaho in the west to Sanandaj and Bijar in the east, Jewish communities developed the language for thousands of years, speaking it alongside more dominant languages as they rose and fell. The Jewish dialects of Aramaic, like other Jewish languages, include many loan words from Hebrew. But while many Jews learn Aramaic in order to study the Talmud, they wouldn't quite understand the Jewish Neo-Aramaic languages that have developed over the last 1500 years. Shifts in grammar, pronunciation, and vocabulary have changed Jewish Neo-Aramaic. For example, the dialects from Sanandaj and Urumieh in Iran include many words from Persian, Sorani Kurdish, Arabic, Hebrew, and Turkish, and even some of their grammar has been affected by those languages. Jewish Neo-Aramaic is so different from Assyrian Christian Aramaic dialects that communities in the same towns would often not understand each other. Jews have many names for their Aramaic languages, including Lishana Noshan or Lishan Didan, meaning our language, and Hosaya or Hulaula, meaning Jewish. By the mid-20th century, most Aramaic-speaking Jews had fled upheavals and moved to Israel, Tehran, and the United States. There's even a tiny community of Aramaic-speaking Jews in Kazakhstan who fled Iran in the last century and call themselves the Lachluch Jews. Today, though there are hundreds of thousands of Jews from the Kurdish region, Jewish Neo-Aramaic is being replaced by Hebrew and English. While Jewish Neo-Aramaic is critically endangered, there are small revival efforts, especially in Israel. There are still living speakers of these important languages of the Middle East, so when we discuss Jewish languages, we should remember to include the original language of the Jewish diaspora, Aramaic. <laughs> Well, thank you, Alan, for creating that wonderful video. It's just uh, very informative and engaging, and uh, I think you did a great job on it.
So now I am honored to introduce Professor Jeffrey Kahn. He is Regis Professor of Hebrew at the University of Cambridge. He received his PhD from the School of Oriental and African Studies in London in 1984. And his publications focus on three main fields, biblical Hebrew language, especially from the medieval period, Neo-Aramaic dialectology, and medieval Arabic documents. He's the ed general editor of the Encyclopedia of Hebrew Language and Linguistics, this massive tome, and is the senior editor of the Journal of Semitic Studies. And his most recent book is the two-volume Tiberian Pronunciation Tradition of Biblical Hebrew. And Jeffrey Kahn, I am going to spotlight you and please tell us everything you know. Good, well, thank you very much, Sarah. And, and it's a great honor to be able to speak at this event uh, and to communicate with so many people. I see we've got so many people here in the, in, the, uh, in the audience. Now I'm going to, I haven't got much time, so I'll get ahead with my presentation. I'm going to try and share my screen now um, and start my, PowerPoint um, slideshow, if I can get this to go. Um, let's take a minute. Um, uh, try that one. Uh, okay, I see it started, it didn't start at the beginning. <laughs> okay, so Jewish Aram, uh, Jewish Near Aramaic, this is what I'm going to talk to you about, very, in quite a quick presentation. Um, first of all, um, can you see that? Sorry, yeah. So, um, I first of all, Aramaic um, is, um, sorry, Sarah, can you see this? Because I, I'm, I've got a message say your sh screen sharing is paused. Is that correct? Or? Uh, no, I, I can see the first slide. Is that, did you move it to okay, the Okay, all right, so I'll, I'll, I'll go on then. Okay. So um, Aramaic in antiquity, first of all, Aramaic is a very ancient beat, a language which has been detested for, for several thousand years. It's first attested about 3000 years ago before the Islamic conquests in, in antiquity, particularly at the end of the first millennium BCE, it was widely spoken across the Mesopotamian region. And it was indeed the official language of the Achaemenid Empire right across Iran to, the, uh, to Northern India. Now, in the modern times, uh, Aramaic survived as a spoken language in, in three main subgroups, and these are referred to as Central Neo-Aramaic, Northeastern Neo-Aramaic, generally abbreviated to Nina, Neo-Mandaic, and Western Neo-Aramaic. And here we see their distribution of these subgroups on the map. These are essentially islands of Aramaic, which have survived from uh, the- we don't, we don't see your slides. We only see the first one. So why don't you stop the share and, and start yeah, again? Start again, yeah, sorry. Um, so, okay. Yes, Hello? you just go to the next slide. Let's just see if the next slide works. Um, yeah. That yeah. One? Yes, that's, that's good. So I'm just showing the, the four islands of Near Aramaic. Uh, in Nina, there's Northeastern Near Aramaic, Central Near Aramaic, Western Near Aramaic, Near Mandaic. These have survived from a period in antiquity when Aramaic was spoken right across the whole region. Now, the Jewish dialects are those spoken in the so-called Nina subgroup. And these are dialects spoken east of the Tigris River in Northern Iraq, Northwestern, Iran and in southeastern Turkey and the uh, and it's important to uh, as we've learned it's in, already in the introductory videos it is important to, to note that in this region in the so-called Nina region there were Christians and Jews speaking Aramaic and the, the dialects spoken by Christians and Jews were very different and even if they lived very close to each other indeed in the same town their dialects were very different and this reflects the fact that the language is an expression of communal identity and often linguistic change is, is driven by desire to express one's communal identity and distinctness from other communities. So I'll just give you an example. In Urmi, in northwestern Iran, we have two dialects, one spoken by Christians and one spoken by Jews. And these sound very different. For example, here is a quick clip from a Christian speaker from Urmi. 
Etwa dans le cadre de la vie, il y a un peu de temps, 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 il And here is a clip from a Jewish speaker from Urmi. It was let for Hashultana. Yashultana at Vale had an cabrata. Albarate Roba Gibevala. Roba Roba Gibevala. So uh, here in the screen, you can just see a few examples of how fundamentally different these two dialects were. They differ in what the all levels of language, uh, phonology, morphology, syntax. So uh, the Christians would say, for example, beta for house. Whereas the Jews would say Bela. And uh, if you wanted to say his house, in, in Jew Christian Omer, you say Betu. Uh, but in Jewish Omer, you say Beleu. And so you get very, very different language morphology. And in syntax, you have different word order. You have put the verb at the end in Jewish uh, Omer, but uh, the verb normally comes before the object, but, uh, but not at the end of the clause. In Christian or me. And then the lexicon's very different. Even basic words are different, like gura, I would say in Christian or me for big and ruwa in um, in Jewish Aramaic. It, uh, it, now a lot of this uh, these recordings I've just been playing uh, can be found on this website we've constructed in Cambridge, which is still under the undergoing development. But you see the address here. Uh, at the top left-hand corner, where you can get access to many, many recordings of Jewish and Christian Near Aramaic. And um, here uh, we go back to the map of the Nina area, where we see all the various, not all, but a selection of the various places where Jewish Near Aramaic was spoken. Uh, and But the main point of this map is to show you that Jewish Near Aramaic can be classified into two subgroups. One is referred to as Lish Lishana Daini, those are dialects spoken north of the great uh, Zab River. And then the other group is called Trans-Zab, Trans which are the dialects spoken east of the Zab River. And so the Lishana Daini dialects are, uh, contain uh, dialects spoken in, in, for example, Zaho, Dohoka, Amadia, and Abetanure, which is a small village just north of Amadia. Um, and here we have just a few pictures of Zaho, Amadia, the beautiful sort of hilltop town an old photograph of uh, somebody, a Jew in Amadia. Transab consists of many, many dialects, uh, including our, uh, in the Arabil and Sulaymaniyah provinces, such as Rustaka, Rwandas, Khoisanja, Halabja, Sulaymaniyah. Then in Iran, Urmi, Salmas, Shino, Nagada, Sablah. And then further south in the Kurdistan and Kermanshah province of Iran, Sakhas. Uh, Karend, uh, Sanandaj, and some others. And here we have the uh, classification again, to just to reorientate yourself on the map. Um, here's a picture of Rwanda's beautiful uh, north mountainous uh, hilltop uh, village or town uh, where uh, we had a Jewish community. Here's a photograph of some Jews in 1905 there. Sulaymaniyah, uh, Sanandaj. And now, the point is that uh, we've heard these, most of the Jewish dialects are now very endangered. They have be, there have been migrations uh, since the 1950s to Israel, uh, and then in the Khomeini revolution in 1978, there was a, a lot of the Jews from Iran left. Uh, and it used to, many of the dialects are, have actually become extinct. Uh, in fact, the interesting thing is sometimes dialects, we, which I thought were extinct, like the one, one dialect like Bashkela in southeastern Turkey, then he suddenly I, I, I found very recently speakers of, of, a lang of, of, of this dialect. So in dialects, sometimes it's not always clear where the dialect has become extinct. But here, for example, I found in Istanbul a few years ago, uh, some old speakers of, of, of uh, the Bashkili dialect. They just play with So, this, uh, you know, this just highlight the importance of documentation of these endangered languages. And very briefly, documentation doesn't mean simply recording. It means a lot of hard work describing the entire language from phonology all the way up to syntax, including creating a dictionary and writing it all down and then making accessible your grammar 
and your analysis and your recording. So it's a massive job. It, it demands a lot of training and uh, quite a lot of funding as well. Um, I'll skip that because for lack of time. But so I'm, I'm going to close uh, by just saying something how about what the, the study of the Jewish dialects can show us about the social relations of Jews with Christians and Muslims. Well, the main part about uh, the Christians and Jews both spoke Aramaic, and uh, they are, if you look at the Christian and Jewish dialects of certain regions, although there is differences, there is still in the same region, there's some degree of convergence. For example, the Jews of Koisenjak would say la chate, he is drinking with this to express what we call a progressive. And the Christians of the same region would use a very similar construction, la, la chate, which although it's different, there's a certain convergence. And the same applies to the Barwa region up in northern Iraq. There's a some degree of a convergence. Um, and in this is reflected also in the uh, affectionate term Qariwa, which is used uh, between Jews and Christians in, the, in, in Iraq, certainly, um, as a sort of literally means uh, somebody close to you. But, you know, the, although there was convergence and there's a lot of close social relations between Christians and Jews reflected by the dialects, there was still a, a, a resistance to, com to complete convergence. And this is reflected by the fact that Jews often had a secret language, like in the region of the Bar Barwa up in northern Iraq. Um, you have an example of some of the cryptic language used by Jews to actually ensure that Christians didn't understand everything they said. And then finally, just a few uh, translations of some of the um, recordings I've made of Jews talking about their relations with Christian, uh, with Muslims. And they have a very close, they had a very generally had a very close relationship with Muslims. For example, here's a, here's a piece from an a, a interview I did with some people from the Arab region who said that you know, when they wanted to leave, a Muslim would come and try to persuade them to stay, not do not go, they, this, this Muslim said. And then there was a case of a, again, from the Arab region of um, a, a Jew, Jew who had a milk relationship with a Muslim family. That is to say his mother gave, as a baby, gave him to, to the, the neighboring Jewish mother to suckle him. And therefore he created this milk relationship between him and the, the Muslim family. And he had a, a milk brother, a Muslim milk brother. So that, that's some reflection of the close relations between Muslims and Jews. So here yeah, I'll close now, but just to just to reiterate that um, it is uh, uh, critically important uh, to get these remaining undocumented Jewish dialects documented. And as I say, documentation means more than simply recording uh, or videoing. You have to spend a lot of time uh, uh, to 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 meticulously go through the whole language. And, and to write it down and to analyze the grammar and to document all the, all the lexicon. So thank you very much. I'll stop there. I'll stop sharing my screen. Great, thank you so much, Professor Khan. That was really interesting and informative. And uh, I, I know that there are a lot of questions in the Q&A already. We're gonna save those for the end because maybe some of the questions might be answered by other uh, panelists. And now I ask Shanaz Youssef Najadian to come on. And let's see, can you turn on your, there you go, okay. And I'll just introduce you briefly. Um, so Jeffrey Khan uh, has done all this wonderful documentation work. Another person who's doing that important work is Shanaz Youssef Najadian. She grew up in a Jewish family in Sanandaj, the capital city of Kurdistan province in Iran. She finished her high school in Sanandaj and then received her bachelor's and master's degrees in library science and educational psychology from Tehran University. She worked at the Tehran University Library and Iran National Television for 13 years. In 1988, she moved to the United States and worked at the UCLA Library for 30 years. And she's currently compiling a dictionary of Jewish Neo-Aramaic. So Shahnaz, can you please tell us about the work that you've been doing, why you've been doing it, and um, what, um, what work still needs to be done? 
Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, I am so honored to be part of this discussion. Uh, as Sarah said, I was born in Sanandaj. Uh, the presence of Jewish community in Kurdistan has a long history uh, and is documented in uh, historical and religious books. Uh, many generations of Jews uh, succeeded and thrived in Sanandaj and also contributed to social, cultural, and economic development of the city and the region. Uh, the most of us were living in a neighborhood they called Agazam, Mahale Agazaman, Agazaman neighborhood. We had very good relationship with our Christian and Muslim neighbors. Uh, the Sanandaji courts called us Musaya Khan, means the followers of Moses, is a plural, the singular is Musayi, means the person who is following the Moses. Uh, so they called us Musaya Khan. Although uh, the uh, predominant languages of Kurdistan, Iran are Farsi and Kurdish, uh, Jewish people in Sanandaj, Saqez, Kamyaran, Keren, Bijar, Bane, Tekab, and other so many cities, uh, they speak a dialect that has uh, roots in uh, Aramaic language. We call this language Lishana Nusha, means our language, or we call it Lishana Hulaula, means Judaism language. And we learn this language only orally without knowing any alphabet of, of this language. Uh, during the time I lived in Sanandaj, uh, up to my high school education, I found out, realized that the families who moved from Sanandaj to Tehran, they spoke Farsi with their children, but not Aramaic. Also, very young uh, Jewish families who started their life in Sanandaj, they prefer to speak Farsi with their children. So, Therefore, I was watching this generation. Maybe they are familiar with the language, but they don't speak it, and this is go on and on. So I was watching my mother language is disappearing. So I came to the conclusion is it would be the best to document the voc vocabulary of this language. So the first thing I did, I talked to my late mother, Tala Khalili. I asked her if uh, we can do this, and she can help me. She was very excited and she was answering every question I had very enthusiastically. After that, whatever I was hearing around me, I just wrote it down. Uh, after a while, uh, I uh, had a collection of this vocabulary and uh, I was going on uh, to document this. In 1988 in Tehran, I met a professor and linguist, Dr. Feridun Junaidi. Uh, I talked to him uh, about the project. He encouraged me and he said it's better to alphabetize all the words and translate them into Farsi. And he wanted to help me uh, to publish this work uh, under the dialect uh, of uh, Jews in Sanandaj. But unfortunately, I moved to the United States at the same time and uh, the publish of this work didn't happen. In Los Angeles, after I was hired by UCLA Library, I met uh, professor and linguist Dr. Yona Sabah, who is from the uh, Kurdistan of Iraq, and he has extensive knowledge about Aramaic and New Aramaic language, and he gave me the best direction. He suggested I write every word on an index card and also translate it into English. Then uh, I did that and I continued uh, to do this over 30 years. And also uh, Professor Stefan Panussi, uh, who is from Christian community of San Andres, helped me for this work. And uh, finally, I digitized this work. Now I want to give you some examples of this language. In our language, we have feminine and masculine. For example, if I say apple, pear, pomegranate, hamushta, kanerta, almota, these are feminine. If I say Door, wall, head, uh, tara, guza, resha, these are masculine words. Uh, in our verbs, uh, we have lots of combined verbs. We uh, bring uh, Kurdish and Farsi languages to our verbs. For example, if I say uh, riding a horse, susi martope, susi is Kurdish, martope is Aramaic. So this is a Kurdish Aramaic verb. Or if I say uh, going to university, danishka zala, Danishka is Farsi, Zala is uh, Aramaic. So this is a combined uh, Persian and Aramaic. 
So beside uh, uh, this word in my dictionary, I added some uh, phrases and expressions that we were using in our daily conversation. Uh, one of them is when a person is not content with whatever he has or she has, uh, they tell uh, search your feet only on the size of your carpet. Uh, be content with whatever you have. Another example is uh, related to my late uh, grandmother, uh, Nana Hanuni. When the family decided that she moves to Tehran to live with our uncle in Tehran, she didn't like it that much. And she said, the stone carries the most weight on its original place. It means a person is more appreciated, more dignified in her own uh, community. So I have so many more examples. I will be happy to answer any questions. Uh, thank you for listening. Great, thank you so much. Uh, and thank you for all the wonderful work that you're doing to document this, this important language. Thank you so much. And now I am honored to introduce Ariel Nostrat. Ariel was born in Tehran to a Jewish family with origins in the towns of Tekhab and Bijar in today's Iranian Kurdistan. He considers Neo-Aramaic to be his mother tongue as it was the language spoken at home. After completing school, he moved to England where he did undergraduate and graduate studies in engineering and worked in the field of management. He made Aliyah in 1988 and has lived in Israel since. In recent years, he's been assisting nonprofit organizations in, the, in their pursuit of organ, operational effectiveness. But most importantly, Ariel is among the founding members of the Lishana Institute, a nonprofit organization created in Israel to preserve Neo-Aramaic language and culture. Ariel, um, if you could turn on your camera, please. Thank you. Great. And there's Ariel. Please uh, tell us a little bit about the organization you started and the work that's being done in Israel to document and engage with this language. Sure. Uh, thank you, Sarah, for that introduction. In the short time that I've uh, been allocated, uh, I'll try to describe the Aramaic ecosystem in Israel, in today's Israel, and the rationale uh, behind the Shana Institute's activities. I'll uh, share the screen in a second. Uh, I wonder if you see that screen that I've just shared? Yes. Sure. Um, No. Basically, uh, the what I'd like to say uh, is that uh, the re revitalization of any language, including Aramaic, is an enormous task and uh, it cannot be but a concerted group effort. Uh, and it was in recognition of this basic fact that the Lishana Institute was formed uh, last year. <clears throat> um, the mission of the Lishana Institute uh, is to act urgently to revitalize the Aramaic language, which is, which is under the threat of extinction, um, even in Israel where there are many Jews who still speak Neo-Aramaic today and who constitute the last generation of Aramaic speakers. There are uh, several challenges in uh, approaching this subject. Um, and uh, to start with, we have a challenge of demographics. As we all know, active speakers of Neo-Aramaic today that can serve as a source of spoken language uh, are in their 70s, 80s, and 90s. This means that access to speakers is decreasing and the scope and our scope of documenting their speech and accessing all testimonials is, 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 is decreasing. In fact, uh, we have already got into the habit of calling on descendants of speakers of the language rather than fluent speakers uh, themselves. 
Secondly, uh, the challenge of linguistic proficiency. The level of proficiency in New Aramaic around the world is currently rather low. For example, uh, most people, most speakers, would find it difficult to hold a debate today at a Talmudic level, let alone a modern conversation about, let's say, climate change or ecology. Then we have the issue of multiplicity of dialects, as uh, uh, Jeffrey mentioned earlier on. Um, historically, there were many dialects spoken in various geographic regions, often in close proximity. However, if uh, one goes for mutual intellig intelligibility between speakers uh, as a main criterion, it is possible to divide most of these dialects into two categories defined roughly according to their geographic origins, separated by the Great Zab River in northern Iraq. In fact, if we are to limit ourselves in this webinar to Iranian Jewish languages, I would, uh, I would argue that in spite of apparent differences in dialects, some communication between groups of speakers does result in mutual intelligibility. We have a WhatsApp group dedicated to descendants from roughly Iranian Kurdistan. But we have been pleasantly surprised to discover that we have mutual intelligibility with descendants from places like Halabja and Soleimaniya and Khoisanjak in Iraq and even descendants from Azerbaijan and Georgia, which uh, uh, you, brings us to a, the, uh, an analogy uh, of uh, something like the English language uh, between speakers from uh, various parts of the world. For example, um, you may say that uh, speakers of English from LA uh, that has never heard Australian English accent uh, would for the first time not be able to understand uh, each other. Whereas after a few uh, and a short uh, discussion between them, it is always uh, possible that we know that it's possible that one understands the other. The other issue and uh, uh, challenge is the nostalgia and family history. There are several groups around the world that need to reminisce and dig into the family history their family history. In doing so, they, they feel they are preserving their new Aramaic language and heritage. We're thankful for the significant work that has been done by many in this field to achieve the commonly shared objective of revitalization. Nostalgia is a positive motivating factor in reviving the language, but often overcome by nostalgic needs, many tend to deprioritize the actual systematic work that is required to achieve the objective. Another challenge is a relevance to modern society. New, Aram New Aramaic is often perceived as just an old mother tongue of some Jewish and Christian communities that left their homelands in ancient Assyria, roughly today's Kurdistan in northern Iraq, western Iran, northeastern Syria, southeastern Turkey, Azerbaijan, and Georgia, and settled elsewhere in the world. Speaking functional and living languages such as Hebrew, English, and others, they feel that they, there's no practical need for Aramaic or Neo-Aramaic, except for fulfilling sentimental needs and tracing their family history. For many, there's no serious uh, justification for reviving the language. For them, delving into Aramaic would only be intriguing at best, and they would readily abandon it as soon as they meet linguistic obstacles. So, um, Nishana Institute, recognizing these challenges uh, met by many revival activists, as I call them, the Lishana Institute, Institute needs to assist them in their efforts to meet these challenges by acting as an infrastructure organization. We believe that activists' motivation may stem from their ethnic origin or nostalgia, which we feel we have to accept and nurture. But we also feel 
We need to enhance their awareness of the very special status and importance of that Aramaic has for all Jews. And that brings me to um, the components of the special status of Aramaic. Uh, first of all, apart from Hebrew, Aramaic is the only Jewish language that has its roots in ancient Jewish history. As we read in uh, Deuteronomy, uh, and thou shalt speak and say before thy, the God, the Lord, the God, uh, a wandering Aramean was my father. Secondly, in ancient times, in most of the Middle East, it was customary in synagogues and prayer uh, centers to translate the Torah from Hebrew into Aramaic because the whole congregation spoke, spoke Aramaic. Aramaic belongs to all Jews. Other Jewish languages like Yiddish, Ladino, Judeo-Arabic, and also other Iranian Jewish languages that are the subject of the current webinars, each belong to a specific group of Jews. In contrast, Aramaic belongs to all Jews as we all originated from the Middle East. So for example, Yiddish speakers could and should claim ownership of Aramaic. Next, uh, uh, Aramaic continued to be used throughout the periods of the Bible, the Talmud, the Zohar, and, and it has found its way into our daily prayers today. Aramaic was a lingua franca adopted by the Persian Achaemenids as a vehicle for written communication between all the different regions of their vast empire with their, with their different ethnic and language groups. In fact, the use of a single official language contributed largely to their success in holding their vast empire together for as long as it did. That empire included today's Middle East and beyond, and it extended over a long period, including parts of the first and second temple period in Israel. In the book of Esther, the royal decree of, uh, all the royal decrees of King Ahasuerus that we read about were most likely issued in Aramaic to ensure that they were understood in all the territories of the empire. Aramaic was rather similar to the English language of today used in the social media to ensure universal reach. And I think that is not a far-fetched uh, uh, analogy. Aramaic was also adopted by Jewish scholars all over the world to document their work and, and has left its footprint in virtually every piece of Jewish literature. Here's a short list of the activities that Lishana Institute is involved in. First of all, enhancing public awareness of the relevance of Aramaic as a language belonging to all Jews by holding conferences, seminars on the subject and vast coverage on Israeli radio, TV, and social media. Secondly, establishing practical tools for studying and transmitting new Aramaic to new generations. As an example, we are working on a collaborative online dictionary uh, addressing as many dialects as possible and using a user interface for both English and Hebrew speakers. Thirdly, digital document documentation, conversations, and interviews with surviving speakers. Fourth, encouraging the development and conducting cultural programs in new Aramaic such as music, art, film, and documentaries. And lastly, and possibly most importantly, lobbying Israeli governmental bodies to secure the recognition of Aramaic as one of the, as one of the official languages in Israel, hopefully resulting in educational and cultural programs accessible to the general public. In fact, if we had a very successful, we had a very successful meeting last week, with members of the Israeli parliament, the Knesset, where all our requests 
virtually were accepted in principle. I should add that all this was a result of the tireless efforts by the Lishana chairman, Dr. Yaakov Maoz. Interestingly, it may be noted that in 2017, the Knesset recognized the Aramaic identity of the Assyrian Maronite Christian community in the Galilee. Members of that community have since become eligible to register in the Israeli population registry as Aramaic. Although this is not our intention, it is indicative of successful lobbying in similar fields in Israel. Also indicating that Israel is not only preoccupied with war and peace issues and elections, but also uh, with many, many civic issues. So on that last subject, I'd like to uh, expand before I finish uh, about the Lishana lo lobby at the Israeli Knesset. By the way, two members of the Knesset are descendants of New Aramaic speakers, including the Speaker of the House, M.K. Miki Levy. Objectives of Lishana Knesset lobby in 2002 are as follows. First and foremost, preparation and submission of an Aramaic bill for approval by the Knesset Constitution Committee, followed by legislation recognizing Aramaic as one of the official languages in Israel. Secondly, discussion in the Knesset Education Committee on the integration of Aramaic into educational system as, a, as part of the Jewish heritage studies, followed by allocation of state resources to, act, to, act, to activities around Aramaic language, culture, and heritage. Thirdly, state decision to recognize and support Lishana Institute activities. And lastly, enhancing public awareness of Aramaic as part of the Jewish and Israeli identity, starting with a conference at the Knesset itself. Just to give you an intriguing indication that some things do move, last week I got a message from a colleague to report that he was the first tour guide in Israel to receive a license from the Ministry of Tourism to guide in Hebrew and Aramaic. That is itself uh, deserves a celebration. In closing, I would like to thank Professor Sarah Beno of the HUC's Jewish Language Project for organizing and hosting this invaluable webinar for many of us. Thanks also to uh, Jacob Kotner and Daniel Bovert-Udo of Wikitowns for their wonderful cooperation on virtually every matter that is thrown at them. Thanks a million. By the way, tomorrow, 21st February, is the International Mother Language Day, which is held to promote multilingualism uh, and awareness of linguistic and cultural diversity. I'm not sure if UNESCO uh, had Aramaic in mind when it formally announced this Memorial Day in 1999, but many of us can justifiably celebrate tomorrow anyway. Finally, I'd like to use this platform to call on anybody who's prepared to volunteer and play an active role in the endeavor that I have outlined here. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Ariel. Now I'm honored to introduce Alan Niku. Alan is a filmmaker, writer, and scholar of Mizrahi culture from San Luis Obispo, California. A native speaker of Persian, he spends his time learning related Jewish languages, including Jewish Neo-Aramaic, deciphering Judeo-Persian manuscripts, and interviewing community members about their stories. He dabbles in traditional music, cooking, and liturgy, teaches history and Jewish heritage at various levels, and seeks to teach the world about the underrepresented cultures of the Middle East through his writing and films. And you saw an example of that with the film that we just showed. And um, now you're gonna hear from him about his current project, uh, Alan. Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, um, I'm gonna tell a, a little personal story about my connection with, uh, with Jewish Neo-Aramaic. So um, as Sarah mentioned, I'm a Persian speaker. I grew up in the United States. Um, and my grandfather was born in Sanandaj, and he spoke 
Jewish Neo-Aramaic of San Andaj. Um, growing up, this was a language I always heard referred to as Kurdish, as Kurdi, which is what people in Iran tended to call it. Um, and I always had an interest in these kind of hidden secondary languages. So I spoke Persian, but it was exciting that there was also Kurdish. And I knew some Hebrew because of Judaism. And then I found out that there are some prayers that are actually in this language called Aramaic. So I had a, I didn't know these were, that Jewish Kurdish was Aramaic. I had separate interests. And then as the years went on, I started trying to learn uh, Kurdish and I, was learning them from like learning it from online dictionaries and I was learning Aramaic just by reading translations in the Sidur and trying to figure that out and then I had some relatives and kind of more distant relatives um, not my own immediate family who spoke the language still so I learned sentences from them and eventually I started to realize that this language of my grandfather which I never spoke um, and I never really knew my grandfather he died when I was three I I realized that this language was was actually Aramaic and not Kurdish. Um, it was Aramaic with little bits of Kurdish and little bits of Persian in it. So I always wanted to learn this language, even though there, it wasn't a practical need. It wasn't, um, you know, everybody who speaks it also speaks Persian, Farsi, so I could speak with them anyway. Uh, and so I realized that, I don't know, I just wanted to learn it because it, it felt like a connection I could have with my grandfather who I never really knew. And so I started looking for ways to learn this language. As people have mentioned, all the dialects are really different. All the, the, the little, um, you know, you can't just learn one dialect and then say that you know a different dialect. You can't really do that. So I found resources to learn a Christian dialect from Southern Turkey. And I started learning that, but I started to see like, this is not at all the same as the language that my distant relatives speak. And I even traveled to Iraqi Kurdistan in 2017, which is a story of its own. While I was there, I went to Assyrian towns and I would speak with people in the little bit that I knew of my dialect. And they would look at me like, we understand what you're saying, but kind of, you know, like it's pretty different that, you know, there's a lot of miscommunication. And so eventually one day I was sitting there just looking around the internet and I found a book by Jeffrey Kahn. Um, so I'm very pleased to be on this panel with him. And it's the book where Jeffrey Kahn actually went through and described the Sanandaj dialect of Aramaic in full. It's like a 600 page book. It's all, it's very linguistic, linguistic-y. It has a lot of technical terms because it's meant for linguists. It's documenting the language. But luckily for me, I'd studied linguistics in college. So I knew what subjunctive means and what ergative means and all these things. And so I was actually able to start learning this language for real. So I had a, a little notebook that I have here with me that I spent a bunch of time just writing down words and grammatical constructs and everything. And started to learn this language uh, just from the book. And I would, you know, I'd go on runs in the morning. I would have some lyrics of a song in my head that I know and I would translate it as I ran and then when I got home, if there wasn't a word I knew, I would go look it up. Or if there wasn't a grammatical construct I knew, I would look it up. But still, you can't really, you can't really learn a language just from, from a book. You still have to, to speak it and try it. So I would take what I was learning and I would go and, uh, and corroborate with people that I knew and with my dad's friends who are from San Andaj and speak the, the language. Or I would go meet people. I would be sitting in a synagogue and suddenly hear two people over there speaking this language and I'd kind of like lean over and they wouldn't think that I could understand them because nobody really under the age of 50 speaks this language. And so I would kind of lean over and I'd hear what they're saying and then I'd say in Aramaic, I know, right? And they'd look at me um, and we'd start to talk and I'd start to practice with them. And some of the people you saw in the video are people that I, you know, grandparents of my friends who I'd go and sit around with and just talk and practice this language. I met Shahnaz, who uh, is working on the dictionary. And um, it, it became this really gratifying thing for me to be able to learn this language that nobody in my immediate family speaks. Nobody spoke since my grandfather who died when I was three. And it, it just became a part of 
like this very exciting part of my identity. And to the extent that um, recently, like I've even gone to his grave and sat there and talked to him in his language, which I know is really just for me, but it was cool to sit there and talk to him and tell him about who I am and about how everyone's doing. And um, he's even, to get a little esoteric, he's even come to me in dreams recently. And like, we just sit there and talk to each other in, in Aramaic, which is a, a crazy thing because even my, my parents don't speak it. Um, and so, I don't know, I just started to realize that, that for me, um, this became a really important thing that I want to do with my filmmaking, filmmaking and with my, my work because uh, everybody talks about Aramaic as a dead language or a dying language. And for me, like it was actually bringing my grandfather back to life in a way. It became like a life language. And so I don't know what the future is for this language. I think it's hard for, for people in America and in Israel to even teach their kids Farsi, much less the next language, much less Aramaic. Um, but events like this are, are really exciting. Events like this are, are what give me hope. And uh, they give me hope that maybe I won't be the youngest speaker of this language left. So I want to thank everyone for, for coming to this and for being part of this, uh, this event. Wow, Alan, that's beautiful. Thank you so much. So we see that that Jewish Neo Aramaic is is connected to family experiences, and um, we're now going to turn to another uh, set of people who have family experiences with Jewish Neo Aramaic: Alon Azizi and Adi Kadusi, and. Um, they, uh, based in Tel Aviv, Adi and Alon have backgrounds in various styles of music. With their current project, Hula Hula, they aim to revive their family's ancient language of Aramaic with beats that will make people around the world dance while asking, what language is this? They're planning to release their first single this year, followed by their debut al album. And I'm gonna ask Alon and Adi to explain how they got interested in Jewish Neo-Aramaic and why it's important to them to create new music in this language. Hi, thank you so much, Sarah. We're really excited to be here with you guys. Um, I will, I think I speak for both of us um, and, and I join also Alan uh, that we didn't, we did not know that our families speak Aramaic. Uh, we also thought that it was a mixture of Farsi and or Kurdish. And only in recent years, we discovered that the language that our family speaks on a daily basis is actually Lishana Noshan or Neo Aramaic. And um, for me, it was a, like a revelation that I felt that I, I, I had no idea that my family holds such a precious treasure, let's say. That's how I saw it. Something that is um, uh, slowly or actually pretty pretty quickly we can say disappearing from the world and if we don't do any something right now to cherish it we're gonna lose it forever and I felt that that was my that was my goal to to do something or to find a way to to um, have this uh, cultural experience in a way that we can share it with the with the younger generations and with future generations and to, to save something from my family and from our heritage. I think furthermore, um, the fact that we have such a huge history of that goes back 4,000 years ago and goes back to the, to the uh, first um, uh, temple. Um, and, you know, historically, this is such a, uh, an import, there's such an importance of preserving this uh, language so it's also it's not something that is also meaningful to us as a, as a something of our families, but it it also has a much more a bigger aspect of what it means to the world where we, as a, the descendants of Aramaic speaking people, um, what we can do about it right now, how we can do something with what we do in our daily on a daily basis, which is music. Um, this is our way to contribute to saving our make and i wanted to add that when we started to work on this um, musical project we did find the language but we couldn't find music that is uh, based in uh, sanandaj in, in iran or elsewhere uh, like other um, 
uh, people from, from Morocco, or from other places in the world, there are a lot of music like songs from the synagogue, uh, uh, folk songs that uh, those people have, but we, I, we didn't find any kind of music like this. So I want to, uh, to take this opportunity and say to all the community that hear us, if anybody knows or has a recording of his grandparents uh, singing uh, songs that are folk music from uh, our region at, or from synagogues or, or even texts, uh, any kind of text like a prayer or something uh, uh, not holy, it would uh, be great uh, to receive them so we can continue our uh, project. Our uh, main uh, goal is actually, as Adi said, to uh, is to take it, take this language and take this music to the world, that uh, people will know that there was uh, that there is uh, amazing uh, uh, language that nobody actually, a lot of people don't know about it, and uh, it has such a great uh, uh, history. So, um, so as I said, um, my family uh, originally came from Bijar and um, they moved uh, my, my grandmother, Lily, bless her soul, she just <laughs> celebrated 90. Um, and she and my grandfather who passed away 30 years ago, Eliyahu Kadusi, they came from Bijar and uh, during 1949. 49 and um and when my 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 dad actually was born in israel and um you know he married someone not from the community and therefore my uh, my my family like my mother tongue is not aramaic is not lishana noshan and both of us discovered it in a very um, early, um, late age, let's say. So our mother tongues are not Lishana Noshan, but we do our best to learn the language like Alan did. Uh, and th the way that we do it is through, through music. So we try to practice it, but eventually we really let the music talk because we know that we can't, we can't say or pronounce the word exactly as it is. Uh, we're not academics like uh, Professor Khan here. Um, so this is our way to, to give respect to the language. And we really hope that if anyone wants to open uh, an Arab Aramaic uh, lesson or a class, please sign us up because <laughs> we're very, very enthusiastic about it. Um, I think this is the time to share our first song. Um, we've been working on it for more than a year now. Uh, we have a bunch of songs, and these two are the ones that we can finally share with you. Um, you want to tell them? Okay. Um, so it's a, a question—a question about different dialects. So first, it's a few-part question: Are there so many dialects and differences between Jewish and Christian variants because they were isolated population and had little or no contact? with the other groups or did Jews have more contact with Jews from other towns than with the Christians from their towns and what um how how should we refer to them as dialects or languages if they are not mutually intelligible then aren't they separate languages right yeah well it's a very important question a big big question very important question um well, first of all, I mean, there are several factors that uh, explain the diversity of dialects in, uh, in the Kurdistan region. I mean, one of them is antiquity. I mean, the fact that when you have many diverse dialects in a, in a place, it, it reflects antiquity. I also like to give people the, example, the comparison between England, the dialects of English in England and North America or Australia, where you have migrants. Essentially, in England, there are many, many dialects. I mean, unfortunately, even the English dialects are now a bit endangered, but basically we have a great diversity of regional dialects. Whereas in North America, it's less so. Obviously, there are some distinctions in regions. So diversity reflects antiquity. So the fact that there are many Jewish dialects and many Christian dialects reflect the fact that Aramaic has been spoken there for many, many generations, going all the way back to antiquity. Now, the issue about why there's differences between Jews and Christians, as I was saying in my talk, the, uh, one of the major motivations is the issue of <clears throat> the role of language as, as an emblem of identity. 
in that <laughs> Jews and Christians felt themselves to be distinct, have distinct identities, obviously, and they expressed that through language, not necessarily always consciously, but there was a, a kind of the, 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 lang the dialects diverged and changed as an expression of communal identity. Um, yeah, so those, those are the sort of the major factors. Um, what was the other, there was some of the elements of the question was there? Or? Um, uh, well, I actually do have a, another question for you since you're already speaking um, about the relationship between ancient and neo uh, Jewish Aramaic. And um, it, so would you say that Jewish Neo-Aramaic is the oldest living Jewish language? And can, can we talk about continuity between the Aramaic and the Talmud and the Neo-Aramaic that you're documenting? And why not just call it Judeo-Aramaic in, instead of Jewish Neo-Aramaic? Okay, well, the issue is, of course, there are many forms of written Aramaic. Now, in, in terms of Jewish dialects, we have obviously things like the language of the Targums, the language of the Talmuds. Um, but, um, and some of these, of course, come from the Mesopotamian region, like the like Babylonian Talmud is coming from, come from Mesopotamia. So, but the, 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 the important point about Jewish Neo-Aramaic is that it, it, it has different roots from the attested form of written Jewish Aramaic. And it is, it is equally ancient. In fact, indeed, is probably more ancient than, say, Jewish Tal Babylonian Talmudic Aramaic. It simply was, 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 it had, has been a vernacular language for many, many generations, going all the way back to antiquity, but running in parallel to literary forms. I think that, that reminds me of one of the, the questions was this year, is it a language or dialect? Well, basically the distinction between dialect and language is not really something scientifically provable. It's really, it's all an issue of what you feel is it your language. I mean, Jews and, and Christians often would typically think they have a distinct language in terms of Aramaic, and it's because they feel that what they speak is an emblem of their identity, therefore it is their language. So and that is essentially, so there is a social, social identity disc, um, definition of a language. Yeah. Okay, thank you. The next question goes to Shanaz. Uh, the question is, what was your favorite part of compiling the dictionary? And when is your dictionary coming out? Because some people here can't wait to get a copy. <laughs> the most important part that I find out of how many verbs that we have is combined with Kurdish Aramaic or Persian Aramaic, so many of them. And also I was so happy that I documented some of these especially phrases and expressions that we use in our uh, you know, conversations in daily life. And we don't know when your dictionary is coming out, but we, we have talked about combining the work that you've done with the work that Arielle is doing um, with, with Lishana Institute and creating a massive online dictionary with recordings of each entry while there are still native speakers around to record those entries. So, so that's in progress and uh, hopefully we'll have that, uh, I don't know when, um, but maybe in a year or so, because it does take a long time and takes a lot of work from, um, the, from people who know the language and also just from people who volunteer and, and want to help out. Actually, helping with the dictionary is a great way to learn the language. So if there's anyone here who wants to learn the language and wants to be an intern for this project, please reach out and I'll connect you with the appropriate people. Um, the next question goes to Arielle. And um, the question is, assuming that Aramaic is recognized as an official Israeli language, um, how are we to assure that this will focus on modern Aramaic rather than on ancient forms of Aramaic, which are already part of the religious curriculum? And does it, um, how do you know, how do you figure out which dialect to focus on as for that recognition? Uh, it is a really huge task to, to take a decision of that kind. Um, I think that uh, for uh, writing purposes, there is uh, virtually no alternative but to adopt uh, this, the, the script that uh, is commonly used for the uh, ancient Aramaic, uh, like in the, in the Talmud. Um, but in terms of uh, the 
uh, in terms of uh, spoken uh, Aramaic, New Aramaic, uh, and the way people will be speaking it, uh, uh, I can I can say very uh, uh, I'm very pleased to say that we have discovered uh, from real experience of uh, several uh, people in our groups that there are basically no more than two groups that we need to address. We may have to distinguish between these two groups in defining which uh, which accent or which dialect we are going to adopt. Uh, but certainly within each of those two groups, there's going to be virtually no difference. And I believe that uh, in time, uh, people within that, within each group will be able to communicate uh, between each other rather easily. Again, I'll come back to the loose example that I mentioned in my, uh, in my talk earlier of uh, English language between two, two different various parts of the world. Uh, there is a mutual intelligibility between, I would argue, almost all English speakers in the world including people whose uh, mother tongue is not English. I hope that uh, throws a little bit of light on that uh, question. Okay, thank you. Um, and then um, for there's a lot of praise for Alan for learning this language and for Alon and Adi for learning it and creative, creating music in it. And a question for Alon and Adi is, when will your album come out and how can people get it? <laughs> well, um, well, we already know that um, it's going to be featured in a well-known um, TV show in the future. Um, we can't say at the moment, but um, this is something that is very exciting for us. And I think it's a meaningful step for everyone who speaks uh, Lishana Noshan. And so that's, uh, that's something. And, um, and we hope, we plan to release the first single in May. And uh, later on, you'll, you'll see, you'll hear more and more songs. Please uh, follow us on social media, on my page or Alon's page, um, or write us. Uh, there's Facebook, Instagram, whatever you choose. More okay. to come. <laughs> okay. Great, thank you. Um, so I'm now going to turn it over to Hannah Pressman, our, uh, the Jewish Language Project's Director of Education and Engagement. And um, she's going to tell us about, um, to thank our sponsors and tell us about future events from the Jewish Language Project. Hannah? Thank you, Professor Benor. Um, on behalf of the HUCJIR Jewish Language Project, I'd like to thank everyone in the audience for attending today's wonderful presentations. I know I learned a lot. Um, so thank you to our sponsors for making this event possible, the Iranian American Jewish Federation, Nessa Synagogue and the USC Kasdan Institute. Additionally, thank you to all of our many co-sponsors. 30 years after, American Jewish Committee, American Sephardi Federation, ASF Institute of Jewish Experience, B'chol Hashan, Endangered Language Alliance, Iranian Jewish Women's Organization, Jemena, Shai Sephardic Heritage Alliance, Inc., UCLA Allen D. Levy Center for Jewish Studies and YNS Nazarian Iranian Young Leadership Initiative of the Jewish Federation of Greater Los Angeles. So many wonderful partners, thank you. And lastly, thank you again to all of the panelists for today's fascinating discussion and the beautiful musical performance. Cannot wait for Adi and Alon's single and album to come out. Today's panel was the third in our ongoing series focusing on languages of the Jews of Iran. The final event will take place on Sunday, March 13th at 10 a.m. Pacific, and note that daylight saving time starts that day. The topic on March 13th is Judeo-Persian in the 20th century new research. You'll see Alan Nikiu again, along with several other experts um, who will be sharing about that topic. And it should be a wonderful conclusion to this series. Hundreds of people, in fact, have attended each of the events in our Languages of the Jews of Iran series, showing that there is huge interest out there in this topic. Our organization is currently raising funds specifically to help preserve Iranian Jewish languages. 
we are now about 30% of the way towards our goal of raising $12,000. That's the money required to record 20 speakers of these critically endangered languages and create resources such as videos, translations with subtitles, and dictionaries that will be accessible to the public now and for future generations. If you'd like to support our efforts, please visit the Give Campus link that Professor Benor is dropping in the chat. The fundraiser runs until the end of March and we really appreciate your support. So now I wanna quickly highlight two other upcoming events on our calendar. On Monday, February 28th, 9 a.m. Pacific, 12 Eastern, Professor Benor will give a multimedia lecture entitled Jewish Languages Today, Endangered, Surviving and Thriving. That talk is co-sponsored by the ASF Institute of Jewish Experience. Also mark your calendars for Sunday, March the 6th. We're joining up with The Forward and Shalom, an organization based in Sydney, Australia, to host a conversation about Jewish Wordle, which will look at the Yiddish, Ladino, and Jewish English versions of 2022's most popular word game. Jody Rudoran, editor-in-chief of The Forward, will chat with the creators of these puzzles, and Professor Benor will provide commentary as well. Note that the Wordle event will start at 3 p.m. Pacific, which is later than our typical start time. For more details and registration for all of our upcoming events, please visit our website at jewishlanguages.org events. While you're there, you can sign up for our mailing list and access many online exhibits, articles, and videos of past events, including today's. You can also check out our social media feeds for fun facts, content from our partner organizations, buzzworthy language news, event reminders, and more. Here at the Jewish Language Project, we are committed to documenting and raising awareness of the linguistic diversity of Jewish communities around the globe. We believe that there is a world of history in every Jewish language, and every speaker has something to teach, which I think today's panel definitely demonstrated. Thank you again for joining us for today's program. We hope to see you again soon. Have a wonderful week and stay safe.